All right. So thank you all for joining today. Um, uh, we're going to have Ron to present today at this hour, um, chapter five of the book, which is basically pandas. And uh, I hope we'll enjoy the session. Uh, over to you, Ron. All right. Thank you. Hang on one second. I just going to make a note. Okay. So let me share my screen. This is the part where I always get the wrong screen. Here we go. Hopefully you can see the uh, Quarto rendered document now. Oh, no, we can't because I didn't actually push the button. Push the button. There we go. Now you should be able to see it. <laughs> Correct? Okay. So we are on uh, chapter five and we're going to start looking at pandas. And as you probably gathered, pandas is key to uh, doing data analysis, data science in Python. And so it's not just this chapter. This chapter is kind of getting started with pandas. It's actually five or six, depending on how you count them, chapters ongoing here. That's going to get us deeper and deeper into how we can use pandas. This chapter seemed to me like a long chapter with a lot of examples in it. So I didn't go through everything for this presentation. I mean, you have the book, you're going to read it. I just wanted to kind of bring out some things that I wanted to highlight. Um, and so it's like I. We're going to take a little tour of pandas. So everybody, let's hop on this panda bus here. We'll take a look through what pandas is. Let's see now. I already said this. And uh, yeah, it works with NumPy. It um, adds support for um, tabular and heterogeneous data, whereas NumPy is mainly just for numbers, just for number crunching. So pandas is what it does is adds in this feature. First thing we should mention is the import conventions, remember for NumPy, you know, you import NumPy, uh, the convention, it's not required, but the convention, most people use import NumPy as NP. The same thing for pandas, except now we use PD, and there'll be more of these as we go through uh, different little conventions. And if you follow these conventions, and if you find examples online somewhere, they'll probably be able to just type it right in. Uh, pandas comes with a several, oh, I was going to say one other thing. So I'm going to, I'm going to highlight things that are, I thought were important, but maybe you thought there are other things important. So when we get through a part of this chapter and you say, hey, wait a minute, what about this? Or something wasn't clear and you have a question about it, jump in there and interrupt me, please. Um, I would uh, certainly appreciate that. This is meant to be an interactive uh, experience, right? These book clubs, we're all reading this together. Okay, so back to the pandas. There are two real primary data structures in pandas, a series. This is like a one-dimensional thing. It's a wrapper around NumPy arrays, essentially, except there can be series of strings, series of other objects, and data frame, which is the two-dimensional, or more, as I think we'll see later, two-dimensional um, tables. And this is very, very similar, if you're familiar with R, and I think most people in this community are familiar with R. R are familiar with R. If you're familiar with R, then you, this would now be um, very similar to the data frame in R or a table in uh, Tidy. And it serves the same purpose. I think inspired by actually would be a good way to say. It. I think they, they copied that idea from R into, um, into Python for pandas. Okay, so the series is the first structure they talk about in this uh, chapter. Uh, a series can be constructed by using the series constructor, just say PD series, and then put in any kind of array-like thing you want. Um, and you can also act, add a uh, optional index like this. Here I put an index of, of A, B, C, D. That means I'm just naming the rows of the series, the elements of this series, uh, A, B, C, D. And you, if you look at that, you just print the object by just typing OBJ, you'll get the string representation which in this case looks just like this. And you'll see it's similar to NumPy that actually has an internal type that's telling you about. I gave it integers, so it assumed I wanted integers 64s. If you don't specify an index, you'll just get uh, 0, 1, 2, 3, 4 in this case, or 0, 1, 2, 3 as the index. You'll just have a default index. And using the default index is actually fairly common. Uh, so for these series objects, you can select them by labels, like you say, oh, give me the uh, element at A, and you'll get like, it's almost like a dictionary, you get the element at A, you get the four back, and you can actually ask for multiple elements, in which case you'll get a sub-series back like this, like can ask for the elements A and C, and I'll get this sub-series out. And it'll also take Booleans, uh, Boolean arrays, and do the, the thing you expect from your experience with NumPy. I want all the objects that are greater than three, and there I get them. Oh, go ahead, Sam. 
So a quick question. So here yeah. when we want to um, select two items, for example, for selecting only one column, um, um, A, we use A, but what about if we want to select two, I can see we use double square bracket, right? Yeah, you have to use the double square bracket to do that because you say you're passing in a list of, in this case, elements that you want. Ah, okay. So, Okay, so you are just passing like a list of what. Yeah, but I'm, it's, I'm glad you point out because I've been using pandas for a little bit now. I'm not nobody by no means an expert, but I forget those double square brackets all the time and it throws me off. It, but I, this is just a HTML document. If you try it yourself, you'll you'll get sometimes cryptic errors like, huh? I don't know what that means. <laughs> so something to watch out for. These uh, these series objects are, are are kind of just like NumPy arrays in the sense you can just do math with them directly like object times three i'll get a new series back that's every element is multiplied by three or i can use the numpy u functions and exponentiate it and i'll get exp it'll exponentiate every single element in that series uh one other thing i want to point out just it's useful to know that you can take an object and convert it to a dictionary it does act similar to a dictionary so it should be no surprise that i can make a dictionary out of it and you can go the other way as well. I could pass this into series and I'll get uh, a dictionary. I mean, I'll get a series back out. And it's also sometimes useful to get that underlying uh, NumPy array out of a series. And you can do that by just using two NumPy. It's a recommended way to do it. So that's series. Now for the more important and, and somehow what you'll use a lot more is the, uh, in some sense, you'll be using a lot more as the data frame. The data frame now represents a table of data, and it has both a row index and a column index, or called column. So there's a row index called index and a column index called index. Uh, I'm sorry, let me try that again. A row index called index, and then a column index called column. Just something to keep in mind. That those are extra things that are, are attached to these pandas objects, these indexes. So here I'm going to create a little test uh, data frame to create one you use the constructor data frame and you can pass there's a lot of ways to create a lot of ways to create data frames. Probably the most common is by importing from CSV file or something which we'll learn in the next chapter, but if you want to create one just in by hand you can do it from a dictionary like this, or if I have some like numpy arrays or whatever or any other kind of arrays that I want to put them in together into a data frame, you can do it like this so I just pass in a Python dictionary, the keys become the um, column index and then whatever these these array like things become the columns so I, i'm creating a data frame with a column cars a column miles per gallon a column year and then if i show what that looks like it formats nicely here i've got three columns cars miles per gallon and year this is my data frame and i want to point out on the left here where it says zero one two three that's the row index i didn't tell it i didn't give it an index so it just created one for me zero one two three i just want to emphasize that because for me that's one of the things i found tricky with pandas is these indexes sometimes will throw you off or th throws throws me off periodically because sometimes when you do stuff to a pandas array it'll mess up your not mess up it'll probably in a in a smart way change your index but it's not maybe what you expect uh let's see so with data frames, when you do this bracket cars, you can get the, uh, bracket something, you'll get um, a column. So this is the quick way to get back a column and you'll actually get a series. I didn't give it a series. When I made this thing, when I asked for the column called cars by using the bracket indexing like this, I get back a series named cars and it has these th four elements in it. Again, with the, the same default index. And if I want multiple columns, and this is extremely useful, you want to do this less selecting multiple columns out of your data set because I only want to work with, like, say, four or five different columns. I can just grab those few columns that I need by using this notation here. It's the same notation we use for the series object, but now we're just giving it a list, a list of column names that we want to subset, as it were, right? And I get back another pandas object with less columns in it. You'll often see, and you can use the a dot notation for this. They can go like test.cars to get a column. They don't usually recommend doing that because it's kind of restricted. You can only use that with columns that have valid identifiers as names, and it can sometimes get you in some trouble. But I do see a lot of people using that. And finally, for these things, you can grab rows by using this new special uh, 
thing uh, called I lock and lock. And I didn't give any examples here, but we'll see some more examples when we get to the section on uh, selecting um, stuff from these data structures in essential functionality. So, but in brief though, if I just want to get the row name zero, I can just say test dot loc zero, for example, and I'll get the first row. I should have given an example now that I'm here at this point, but oh, well. <laughs> I didn't. Uh, where was I? Okay, so another important operation is creating, now I've got my pandas array, I'm gonna to wanna to do some stuff with it, do some data processing. I'm gonna create a new column. You can just do that by just assigning to a column. If the column doesn't exist, you'll create it. If it does exist, it'll modify it. So here I'm gonna create a new column called model three gallon squared. I don't know why I'd ever want that, but I couldn't think of anything clever. So I just did that. I said, okay, let me just square that test. Well, let me square the model per gallon column and I'll just shove it in this new column called miles per gallon squared. And yeah, there it is, it appeared. Uh, Layla? Yeah, um, I'm still a little bit confused um, between loc and iloc. Um, in terms of when to use which, uh, I'll that comes up a little bit later in here, but um, okay. I can briefly say a loc is used to uh, index things by the indexes, the actual indexes like A, B, C, okay. or the column names or whatever. If you want to do it by position, that's when you use iloc. I want the first column iloc. Uh, well, for a column, you have to do iloc colon comma zero. But if I want the first row, I loc zero. Well, give me the first row. It ignores oh. the index. I thought that was the index. Yeah, the, so the index is an actual object of these pandas. Ob it's kind of confusing because, <laughs> you know, <laughs> there's like the index, we, we index something, right, by using these brackets. And then there's actually is an index, which actually may have values in it in the pandas objects. So yeah, it gets confusing, but when I, I, I need to be able to, somehow differentiate that here, but, um, well, that's actually next index object. So, okay. <laughs> right. So the, uh, index objects, maybe I should just say object here, but the index objects are used for holding the labels for the axes, right? So the index, the index object named index for a panda is the, the axis labels for the rows. And there's also one for the columns called and I'm right here, but test.column will give you the column index, which is the labels for the columns. So those are the index objects. So when I say loc, you can select, instead of saying index, I'll say select. With loc, you can select elements using these indexes from the index of these labels. You can use these labels, which are also called indexes. But with iloc, you can select things by the actual position, 0, 1, 2, 3, the or in the order that they come. Okay. I hope that I hope that clears it up. I realize the index is being used in like three different ways in that sentence. But <laughs> yeah, yeah, I think that's where my confusion was. Yeah. Like index as I know it, and yeah. index referred to as a different thing. Yeah, okay. and I, I, that does get confusing with pandas. So it's just important to keep in mind there is these kind of two uses. There's like the numerical index, you can only think of like in a Python array, you know, zero, one, two, three, or an index in C or any other language. You think of index being zero, one, two, three, but here. Um, that's a position index. There's also these label indexes as well, I guess. Maybe that would help. I don't know. I'm just, I'm just making that up. <laughs> but hopefully it helps. Uh, so anyway, there are these index objects, which are another kind of pandas object, which are used to hold these, these labels and other metadata having to do with them. You don't normally need to deal directly with them, I don't think. But for example, you can um, do the following. Like for my cars panda um, that I created above, I'm going to say, oh, let me just create an index to it. Uh, Add an index to this by saying test.index equals test.cars. So now I'm going to do is take the column that was cars and turn it into labels for the rows, right? Uh, and then next, what I'm going to do is use this drop panda, drop thing from pandas, which allows me to just drop the existing cars thing so it doesn't come up twice. So then I end up with this data structure where now the index, the row index is Chevy, Ford, Dodge, BMW, not, in, not numbers anymore. Uh, and then the cars column is gone because I dropped it. Did I even talk about dropper at all? Yeah, we, but you, maybe not. No, that's kind of out of order, I just realized. But drop is a method you can use on pandas to remove uh, a column or a row, depending on how you use it. I, you can say 
drop axis equals columns, you'll get you'll drop that row. If you did axis equal row, it wouldn't work because there's no row call. Well, yeah, there's no row call call car. So um, I thought I, maybe I must. Oh, I did here. It is. It was in here, but I just kind of brushed right by it. It's, it's another thing you can do to to remove columns. You can delete them, which will remove it destructively from that pen and or drop it non-destructively so it makes a copy. One of the things you'll find in this Panda stuff I've found a lot is confusing, and I, we mentioned it last week with NumPy as well, is that sometimes things will do uh, make a copy and some things will do stuff to the Panda object in place. And in many Pandas functions and methods, you can actually change that behavior with that optional argument called in place equal true or in place equal false. So you can actually override the default behavior, whatever it might be. I think it just takes experimenting and you'll just be, oh, that's not what I wanted. I'll just change it, no problem. Uh, let's see. Now, often you'll come the pandas object back and it'll have this, like we, you want you don't want, you'd like to have this uh, character in this um, labels index back as a row because you want to be able to use it for processing. And you can do that by using reset index. And I know here that when I did test reset index, I actually got the panda right back. And this is one of those non this is one of those non-destructive things. It actually creates a new panda. And so if you want if you wanted to actually modify it in place, you'd have to either use that in place or just say test equals test dot reset index to us, reassign it to the same one or do a different one. So it, that's what break reset index is. It takes that index and resets it back to a numerical index and takes whatever was there and turns it into a new column. I said that like three times only because you'll find this very useful, I'm sure, in the future, because I always end up using a lot of reset indexes after, I, especially after you finish doing a merge or something. Let's see. Oh, and here's, a, as I said above, but I actually did do an example here. If I ask for what's the column index, well, it's also an index object. Here's what it looks like. Those are just my column labels at that point. You note that cars is not in there because, again, this, is, this was non this was non-destructive. It didn't actually change test. That still has no cars column here. Uh, let's see. And then the book has a lot of examples for doing things with these index objects, which I didn't reproduce here because I didn't think we'd, uh, we'd have time. And plus, I don't, the like, kind of things you just look up when you need them, in my view. But look at table 5.2 for more of that. Unless anyone else wanted to comment anything about the indexes, I'll move on. Uh, let's see. Okay, more on indexing after all. You can also re-index an object, which is just like you want to reorder things around, like you want or don't drop a few indexes. You can use re-index to do that. So here I made a little series, one, two, three, four, five, with an index A, B, C, D, E. And I said, okay, re-index that, right? Um, so I say S dot re-index, and I'm gonna the new index I want is A, B, C, F, U. Well, there is no F U in there, so they come back as NANs. I get A, B, C, but I get those two come back as NANs. And yeah, apologies to Gail on the letter choice there. <laughs> if anyone knows that song. <laughs> this is not a song by Gail because there's more letters in it. Uh, so the, um, by the way, that's a good point to point out these missing values are in common with NumPy, same kind of missing values. You'll see these a lot when you're importing data and you'll need to be able to deal with them. And there's a pandas method for that too called is NA or not NA, which you can pass a any kind of panda object in and it'll, it'll it'll return a boolean which you can then use to to filter on or to index on your to get rid of those or to highlight those or have, what do you want to do with your NAs. I talked about drop already but I, I wanted to mention here that you can also pass in instead of saying axis I only found out this today so I'm like oh this is cool I better put this in here that instead of saying axis equals you can just say oh drop columns equal and here you can say a single column or you can put in a list of columns you want to drop or if you want to drop uh, rows, you can say drop index equals uh, Ford BMW, here drop out Ford and BMW, and I get back this smaller data frame where I've dropped those two rows off. Why is it index and not rows equal? I don't know. Actually, maybe rows equal works. I don't know. Anyway, index equal definitely works. And again, these are non-destructive operations, and you can tell that because I don't have to put the word draw, test again on a second line to make this thing print out. So that's re-indexing. Um, now this part is going to go a little bit more into the details of selecting, filtering, and indexing. 
uh, with pandas objects. So this is a little bit of repeat, and this is just the way the book did. I, I don't mind it because like first you get introduced to it, and then you're gonna like dive a little deep, deeper into it, which is fine. <clears throat> so for series, as I mentioned, indexing is similar to NumPy, except you can use integers as well as the index just directly with the angle brackets. You don't need to use a loc um, for or i loc necessarily. It'll, it'll do the right thing. So if I go zero to three on this object I just made here, this is a simple series object, zero, one, two, three, right? Uh, with index A, B, C, D, but I can still say, what's the zero through the third, third uh, zero, what's the zeros through not including the third element? I will get A, B, C. I can do the same kind of range notation with labels, which is interesting. Give me the A through C element or whatever, however you say that, and it works the same way. And I can pass in Boolean, like we talked about before, like you can do with NumPy. Very useful to be able to filter, right? And we can ask for multiple elements. We already talked about that. However, they say in the book, the preferred way to do all these things is to use loc and iloc. If you use loc, you can do everything you just did above, but it's just a little bit more wordy. You have to put object.loc in the list of elements I wanted, for example. But you can't do it with numbers. You can only do it with, with uh, the labels. In iloc, you can only do it with numbers. And the advantage there is it avoids issues where like index is integers, then it can be confusing because the index might be in a different order you could have a numerical index, but it's actually zero, five, three, two, because they're in different order, not sorted, right? And so if you did, uh, you might get surprising results if you didn't use, if you use the, the direct index rather than loc and iloc, right? But local iloc, you'll definitely know what you're asking for. With iloc, I want the zero with element. If I did loc, I want the element whose name is zero, if it is such a, if that is the labels, if that's the index object associated with it. That could really use an example, but I think it's just important to go ahead and, and use loc and iloc for these things to avoid that issue. So here I just want to note, uh, just like in NumPy, you know, when you ask for multiple elements, you get back a NumPy in here with, you ask for multiple elements, you get back a series, you ask for a single item, you get just that item. And it's true if I don't have an example, if I just asked for the list that had only one element in here with double brackets, I'd get back a series with only one element and not the element, just like we saw with NumPy. The ranges. Okay, so that's with series, with data frames, uh, you can do selecting with the same notation. We did that above, we just get one or more columns, right? Uh, if you select a single column, you only get a series, if you select multiple columns, you get um, another data frame. But there's some special cases just to make for quality of life, that if you ask for a range of numbers, indexes from a data frame, you'll actually get back those rows. So this will select the, zero, the first row. Um, and because it is a range, I actually get a data frame with only one row. Uh, and you, if I just did test zero, by the way, it wouldn't actually work. <laughs> that will not select the, only the zero with the first row. You'll get an error. You have to use iloc for that. But if you put a, a range of rows, you will get a range of rows back. It's a special case. Same thing with Boolean selection. We've shown that before. But if I do give me all the rows with, with the miles per gallon is less than 15, it works. I get back a new panda with these only these rows that, have the, that meet that qualification. Um, but you know, normally when I th think of just applying this bracket notation to a data frame, I should get back columns, but it, this is like a special case where you get rows. In general though, if you want rows, you should use iloc and loc, like we talked about before. And you can also use iloc and loc to get columns. You just have to use this big longer notation where you're asking for all the rows. So this says, look, this says Given the taste data test data frame, give me all the rows. This is row column notation. Give me all the rows with these col in, the, in the, only these columns, year and mile per gallon, and that's what I get. But I could put subset of rows in here, or just ask only for rows. So here I want. Um, oh, here's here's where I want only one particular element. Give me the element that's at the row labeled Ford and the column labeled mile per gallon. I get just this one element. And that's how you can do that with loc as well. If I want to do the i loc, I'd have to say one. One, I guess, right? That's the well. Actually, that's not quite true because I have to. That's whatever it is. I don't know what the element of molecular gallon is, but you have you just have to count across. You can use iloc to do that. Uh, these things work with slices and booleans as well. Uh, here I have. I want all the rows with molecular gallon greater than fifteen, but I only want the year column. Oh, no, I want the year and all following columns. That's what that colon means. So I just slice there. So I got that little mini data frame that way.
hopefully that makes sense. It's just a, you know, this loc notation for panda, should, let me just summarize that briefly. The loc notation for pandas is a row comma column. That's what you're giving it. If you want all the rows, you have to use that colon notation, that slice notation in that case. Uh, the book warns about something um, called chained indexing. This is where you're like, oh, let me give me all the rows where it's molecular gallon greater than 15, and then take that. I also only want the column labeled miles per gallon. It won't actually work. You get an error because the thing that comes back from this is just a view or a, a, a copy of a slice, I guess is what they call it. And you're actually at, you, you're trying to modify. Um, Oh, so this is an, I'm trying to assign. That's the key part, right? So I'm saying, give me of the rows where mile per gallon is greater than 15, uh, assign to the mile per gallon column the number 18. And this is where the problem occurs because you're actually not assigning to the original object, you're only trying to assign to a, a, this slice of the object, which is not what you probably wanted. And that's why they give you back a big, confusing looking warning, in my view. Uh, the way to avoid that is to simply uh, use the full row column uh, log notation and then put everything in that one log uh, call and then you can assign directly to that particular S cell. There it is right there, assign properly. So to give you a little rule of thumb, just don't do that. Don't do assignments with chained indexing. You'll be fine. But if you ever see this thing pop up, which you'll see time to time, usually means you're trying to do something to a, a, a copy of a slice as they call it here. So I think it was like a view, a view of the data, not on the real data. Let's see. Yeah, so again, this is just a whirlwind tour of things. And I don't expect, at least, I don't want to expect the, a lot of this to stick necessarily. It's just kind of like where to find these things and what kind of things can pandas do. And as we go through the next five chapters, you'll start using this more and more and get better at it. But in the end, I think it does pay to go through the chapter and do these like either get the code from the website or, or do it yourself, type it in, try these things and try variations. Like, wait, does that do what I expect? No, why? That, that kind of thing is very helpful in my view. Okay, let's see, arithmetic and data. So they mentioned that you can do things like this, like it makes it easier objects have different indexes and it'll generally do the right thing. You can take this series here, this index A, C, D, E, and this other series which has a not overlapping index, A, C, E, F, and I guess G. And if I add them together, it'll try its best to add the corresponding elements. We'll add the elements labeled A, the elements labeled C. For D, it couldn't do it because only one of them exists in, in one array, so it got a NAND. Same thing with F and G. Now, if that's not your intended behavior, you're like, oh, wait, I wanted you to just assume it's a zero if, it's, if there's nothing there, then you can use these methods. So I can say S1 add using a method on the series, S2, and then you say, oh, I want to fill with zero, which means any NAND, any place where you don't have a value in one of the series, assume it's a zero. You can put in anything you want here. If you're doing multiplication, you probably want a one. Whatever identity object makes sense for you in that case. And that's what that does. This is one example. The book goes through many other examples. and has a table 5.5 for a list of all these special methods like div and mult and all the rest of them are use multiply. But um, it also illustrates mathematics you can do between data frames and series uh, in, in ways that's similar to what you can do with NumPy. Again, there's just a lot here. I tried to even pare it down, but already going through it and say, wow, this is just like a lot. But uh, let's see if another important thing is, which we did mention a little bit, is you can apply functions directly to these data, any Python, sorry, any NumPy function, you can generally apply directly to data frames or series, and it'll do the right thing. It'll, it'll broadcast across them, it'll do, and it'll do it fast, which is important, right? The um, So here's an example data frame that they created it for this purpose. And here, this one does have an index, Utah, Ohio, Texas, Oregon, and these column B, D, and E, these numbers are just random numbers just for illustration. And I can apply the absolute value function to the entire data frame, and it will apply it across all the elements in the most straightforward way. Um, often you want to apply functions only to across rows or across columns. There's a thing called apply you can use for that. This illustrated here, where I'm going to apply the max function along the rows, along these rows, right? Uh, so that gives me the maximum for like the B, I'm oh, sorry, I find that I get confused by this, axis equals rows, right, right, so I'm applying the function across the rows, which is kind of, so 
these across the rows means down the column, I guess, right? I don't know why I have trouble with that, but down the columns and what's the maximum for B, what's the maximum for D, what's the maximum for E, and that's what it comes back with this series in that case. But you do a lot of applying. I think there's a lot to learn about applying. This is just kind of a quick uh, start with it, but it's very generally useful. Across the columns is also very useful, right? And probably I, I find myself using this a lot. So I want to know what the, the maximum one in Utah, right? They'll tell me it's 1.076 is the maximum of Ohio on each one of them. That's what I've done here. I just said, give me the apply the function max across on the on the axis columns. Boy, I still find that confusing why that's called access columns, but whatever. <laughs> I'll think about it some more later. Just try them both till you get what you want. <laughs> that usually works. Let's see. I mentioned before that the index, you can, you know, the order must come whatever order you put them in, but maybe you want to sort them, in which case you can use sort index. If you want to sort the data frame by another column, you can just use sort values and put the column name in there. So if I sort by the miles per gallon, I'll get that. There, rank is mentioned in the book about uh, adding assigning ranks to the thing to the uh, to data, so you can do that as well. I didn't give an example because uh, no reason. <laughs> All right, moving on. So uh, the book also goes over a lot of methods for summarizing and computing descriptive uh, statistics with data frames, which I'm not going to repeat here. I just want to give a quick example. Here's a data frame. Where I put some intentional NANDs in it just to show what what happens with those, and if I just apply sum to that, it'll sum uh, by default over the column or over rows, and so it'll say, okay, the sum of one is nine point two five, the sum of two is minus five point eight. You'll notice it automatically just replace the NANDs with zero. Sum uses the identity function in a sensible way. If I wanted to sum over the columns, right? Instead, I can do axis equals columns, and I'll get whatever you know. This going across, right? So a the sum of the each each of the row going across all the columns. You see that? It's how confused I am. That's still okay anyway. <laughs> Let's not worry about that. Extremely useful method on data frames is describe. So you get something back, you're like, what are the stats on this? Just quickly you can do describe and it'll give you like all kinds of useful stats about the data in those columns. And the book chapter gives many, many more examples of these kinds of uh, statistics and to how to do correlation between columns and everything else, which is something definitely worth working through for sure. Um, but in summary, I think the key takeaways from this chapter for me anyway, was that we learned about these two data structures, a series and the data frame, which is like a bunch of series stuck together. Uh, and then we learned some basics about how to access and transform these objects, most importantly being the, the the brackets, uh, the loc function, the iloc function, right? And then I give a link here when I get these uploaded to the site, you'll be able to follow that link, but just a link to the, the pandas um, reference, which you can also just search for pandas reference, you'll find it pretty easily. Uh, and again, my suggestion is to take the time because there are no exercises in this book. Like a lot of books, you, I, mean, I think you learn a lot by doing, so it's definitely worth going through all the code in the chapter, typing in yourself, making sure you understand what it's doing, um, at least at least of passing familiarity, and then like try different things. Like, wait, what does this mean? What happens if I do this? What happens if I only put, what if I ask for the uh, column zero? What happens in that kind of thing? What kind of error do I get back? Uh, doing that kind of thing, I find extremely useful to do. I don't know. Anyway, that's basically what I wanted to cover through. That's what I thought was important from the chapter. Um, Anyone have any questions, additional questions, comments, concerns? Please let me know. No? Okay. Back to you then, uh, Shem. Is he there? Jim, are you there? Do you go somewhere? Oh, wait a minute, Rich. No. Not yeah, there. 
So I, I like again to me that's just like the key things. I don't know. I mean, if you go through that chapter and you come out of that thinking you're you you you've got a good handle on pandas, good for you. But I, I go through that chapter. I'm like, this is like a lot of things. It's not going to be easy to remember until I start using them. And so you just got to keep your bookmark to that page and go back to go. How do I get the row that I want? And why is this not working? Uh, how do I get a set of rows? And you'll see as you go more further in this book, I think more examples of using this, and that'll be great to also type into your your uh, Visual Studio Code or whatever you're using for doing this. Yeah, thank you, Amron. Um, that's a good presentation. And uh, yeah, um, I think there is uh, uh, some exercises that I saw on Pandas, and uh, I will maybe share in the Oh, channel. great. We'll try. Yeah. yeah, so that people may try to attempt the exercises, yeah. That yeah, including um, NumPy and Pandas. Yeah, I will share some exercises later than that. And I will try also to go through them so that I will make sure that I nail the concept, not just listen to on. <laughs> yeah. What issue you might find is that a lot of those exercises might assume things from future tabs we haven't gotten to yet, so I may hold off on those. But okay, I know in yeah. future, just looking at the table of contents, I can see that you know things are doing joins and combines. Oh One yeah, exactly. Powers, oh yeah. Mm -hmm. The most important exactly. powers of the pandas is the fact you can do these joins, combines, and, yeah. and like database type things, mm -hmm. right? That's when it really gets useful. So, in the next chapter, we'll get the chance to actually have a lot more data than just stuff you can type into a, a dictionary by hand. <laughs> yeah, and that's why I sign up for later chapters. Ah. ah. <laughs> <laughs> All right, I'm gonna hop off, guys. Okay, thank you very much, and we'll see you next week. Ciao, ciao. I hope I didn't talk too fast going through that because I see that I thought it was going to take more time than it actually did. But. <laughs>